Good morning, happy Sunday to all of you. Um, I'm gonna get started a little bit early so I can get um, connected with Jeffrey. I don't know if Jeffrey's there, but today we're talking about acupuncture and the TFCC. And for a long time, I have uh, uh, promoted having acupuncture done for people with ulnar sided wrist pain. Um, and so I'm really excited today because um, I have an acupuncturist that's um, willing to take the time to share with you what that means. Let's see if we can get him to, we had some challenges last week, so let's just see if we can find him. Um, so acupuncture is a, um, oh yay, oh yay, hi Jeff, oh yay. Uh, okay, um, it is an absolutely beautiful day here um, on the islands, and <clears throat> so excited to have him. Oh, let's see here. We're just waiting for him to join. Welcome everybody. Welcome Island Daisy. Just waiting for Jeff to join. I sent you. Uh, Oh, yay. <laughs> we figured it out. Oh, so nice. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's really nice to have you here. <clears throat> we'll let nice you introduce, introduce your history and who you are. Um, but what's really unique about Jeff, not only is he on another island, and so he has the same aloha spirit, but he had an early bout with Crohn's disease. Oh, yeah. which you can see a lot in all side wrist pain. So he has a very good personal perspective on the benefits of alternative medicine to help with health. Welcome. We've got 30 minutes, so I'll let you go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Jeff Tice. I'm a uh, doctor of acupuncture. I practice on Maui. I, I did, as, as you suggested, I did kind of find my way to this through some of my own personal health. And I, that seems to be a lot of folks that do the type of work that I do, that tends to be the case is some sort of personal experience ends up uh, painting the, the way to um, a way of kind of giving back is essentially the way that I look at it is, uh, you know, taking some of my own personal experiences and the knowledge gained from that to then expand upon that and find a way that I can also, you know, support other folks along their journeys of, uh, Maintaining health, preventing illness, and, and of course, then treating illness and injury. So can you tell me, um, just give our audience a general idea of um, uh, how you perceive ulnar-sided wrist pain? So <clears throat> in general, in the specific to, to the TFCC injury, I, I tend not to see a lot of that particular injury or at least diagnosed as such, yeah. um, which as you know, is, is uh, often misdiagnosed or, or so starting off with that, I, I do see a lot of wrist injury and a lot of wrist pain uh, more often from uh, usually, uh, whereas some, some of the wrist stuff I see is repetitive stress, like more, yeah. more carpal tunnel in nature. And, but then when I do have a traumatic injury, uh, it, it does often present more uh, ulnar-sided. And so really the cool thing with the medicine I practice is I can use all of those diagnostic terms that we, we, we just mentioned, and they don't matter in, in the language of the medicine I practice, that we tend to just kind of look at the body and scan it in a different way. So what I would tend to do is I would look at 
where the where the presentation of pain is but then i start looking away from that as well and and trying to understand patterns so even with traumatic injury and uh, there's other layers of involvement and especially once it once it becomes chronic once somebody has been dealing with it for a long period of time then it, it's you can argue the chicken or the egg you know was it that there were other patterns that helped to create the potential for the traumatic injury and then there was a, an acute set off to it right uh, in other words the um the fire was built but not sparked until that moment yeah. and then there's the other which is that you know accidents happen and there's just a you know a blunt force accident that can't be prevented but then after a period of time it develops into other sorts of symptoms that to a lot of folks would look unrelated yeah. and and when i was trying to dial in last week and was dealing with all forms of technical issues that are <laughs> uh as much as i i've grown up in the world of technology and always loved all the toys i'm not actually that good with them so apologies for not being able to figure out that i needed to do it on a different device <laughs> but but i did get to listen to you you were sharing that you have a, a good basis of knowledge of, of of our medicine and you were talking about the meridians that tend to be yeah. affected there and being the um <clears throat> by location it deals with the small intestine and the heart meridians uh and and we can certainly look at pathologies that can relate to those yeah. um but when i'm treating injuries i i generally start i try to keep it simple and yeah. i try to start with the idea that here's where the pain is okay what's associated with that what muscles and tendons and how do they you know when you're talking about a joint you always have the tendons that cross over the joint so you can certainly look at those to begin with and i would in in the the foundation of chinese medicine is is the concept of yin and yang or yin and yang as as americans uh, like to say it and i was thoroughly corrected when i started studying this uh <laughs> that it is yin and yang uh and we look at the body we can divide the body into yin and yang parts and so when you're talking about the the top part of the arm that that part of it that would be the yang aspect and then the inside of the arm that part of it would be the yin most of the time in traumatic injuries at least at the acute phase you're going to treat it according to the yang aspects mm -hmm. so you're going to look at in that case you're going to look at all the uh all the uh, extensors and 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 even though uh again it does fall if you're looking at the the ulna and how it um you know articulates to the wrist you're looking at that like you said the small intestine and the heart but it's not necessarily so uh, in terms of once you start coming away from the joint and looking at the different muscles that are uh, traumatized so my apologies if you can hear that noise oh that's There's okay a, <laughs> that's okay i i, I children dogs everything's fine okay <laughs> so yes i have a there's we're, we're we're repairing some flooring in my office and so there's some hammering and some grinding and yeah so okay so so um <clears throat> I have found that acupuncture is extremely helpful for ECU and extensor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi ulnaris symptoms. And yes. so the symptoms are um, pain to touch at the insertion, pain mm -hmm. in the muscle belly and at the origin, snapping or tightness. And I was wondering if you could go through what you would do in, um, you know, each case is unique. I know that, and everybody yes. comes with their um, dynamics and their 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 general health. But in general, if you've got somebody that has, um, let's just start with the ECU, mm -hmm. an extensor carpi ulnaris tendonitis or subluxation, where would you start, and what would you do? So, and this is again when you know I kind of was using the bouncing back and forth between the words of acute and, and chronic, and it depends on yeah. where they are in that uh, progression. Okay. Yeah, and so a lot of times I will not go to attachment or even the tendons themselves when it's acute. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to try to. The approach in our medicine is to. Is it, 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 we have we can do it a lot of different ways. We go if, if pain pain is here, put needle here. Yeah. But sometimes if pain is here, put needle somewhere far away from that. Right. And so the goal there would be that I would probably be looking in the um, 
a combination of the muscle belly and, yeah. and looking for a, um, a trigger or motor point there, something that's going to be really responsive to the needle and yeah. see if we can't create some, uh, uh, some contraction there. And, and, and then I would go to the other side. So now I'd be going much more distal. I'd be going towards the hand or fingers and looking at points to, in some ways you're looking at it as a, you're trying to drain. You're trying to drain some of that acute inflammation and the, the trauma. Uh, one of my um, colleagues who's actually a veterinarian, but uh, is also an, an acupuncture, uh, had a really neat description of how, in this case, when you're talking about like pain, injury, sports medicine approaches, where we are treating uh, inflamed uh, tendons and tendon sheaths and, and, and muscles is that what we're doing is creating micro trauma. Yeah. So the needle, uh, you know, the, our needles are incredibly thin, really, really small. And with a precise location, you're just going to get in there and you're just going to nick the tissue a little bit, which mm -hmm. sends a message to the body to kind of flood some inflammation there or flood some circulation there. Yeah. yeah. And so if we're doing that on either side of where the actual, um, injury is where the tear or where the acute inflammation lies then we're kind of pumping circulation through that yeah. without actually re-traumatizing something that's already a little agitated right right and then um how do you decide or when do you decide to use moxa or an e-stim on top of the needle personally i evidently use very rarely to use e-stim uh i yeah. i have an e-stim machine and i from time to time don't know where it's located because i've gone that long since i've used it the last time yeah. and, and that said it, it is a, it is a common practice it's just more of a yeah. personal preference um as far as moxibustion it's uh, it, it is something that you know 10 15 20 years ago we would be using very regularly in a clinic yeah. but it's getting more challenging. Um, in yeah. my office, I do have one room that has a window. So yeah. we have a window with a fan, an exhaust fan, and we run air filtration in there. But it still will create a smell that some people react to and don't like. Yeah. So what I tend to do with that is I tend to um, have people do it. I teach people how to do it for themselves. Yeah. And therefore, my use of it has changed. Whereas I would use it in an acute trauma, I would use yeah. it when, and, and I would use it very directly at that point, yeah. probably to the skin um, in the area of the injury, because we're, in a way, we're traumatizing the skin, but we're not traumatizing the, the actual damaged tissue, right. but we're sending a pretty strong message to the body to, to pay attention to that spot um, or that region. So where I use it now is more once it becomes a little more chronic, once we're, you know, a few weeks we'll say past the actual original injury and i will at that point just have people wafting teach them how to waft it over the wrist in this yeah. case and it would just be back and forth and over and what's really neat about the use of moxa the burning of the the mugwort is it's it's a heat obviously because it's something you're burning and incinerating but it the type of heat is not surface heat it's, 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 we mimic it in the clinic. So I use a, a TDP lamp, which is to mimic it, which is a far infrared heat lamp. And, and so that heat feels nice and people don't realize until they start paying attention that it's not their skin that's hot. It's yeah. actually the heat is penetrating into the body and the moxa yeah. does that as well. And so if people are doing this themselves with a, uh, the moxa will be formed into either a cigar or cigarette size and shape. Um, they're just kind of like about an inch over the skin. They're wafting it back and forth and you'll feel that heat and it's like a, a warm wave. And that wave is, it's deeper, you know, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting sensation and it feels very comforting. Yeah. And, and so what ends up happening a lot of times is it, I like it. I, lo I love this as a take home tool, which again, like, I've adapted to do this more, but now people, it gives them their own feedback loop yeah. and they're, it helps them kind of connect with that part of their body better. And then they're able to start more so feeling the injury and the pain than fearing the injury and the pain. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really like that. I, I like that question because it got me to say that I really do love that 
idea that people get to then connect to their their injury more and it not be as problematic. They're actually helping themselves. Yeah. Now, do you also use cupping? I do. I uh, and for this, I, you know, joints are very difficult to use. The the, the cups you'd have to use very soon. Yeah a wrist, you would have to use a very, very small cup. <clears throat> They're not likely to stick for very long. Yeah. They, uh, they need softer tissue. They need uh, bulkier areas. So more often than not, when I'm using cupping, it yeah. is on larger parts of the body. However, uh, it, would, it, it is certainly effective on the uh, muscle bellies and the forearm. Right. Okay. So, and it, um, and if, I was just going to say, so cupping is something that uh, what year is this now? 21. Five years ago right now, hardly anybody knew what cupping was. Yeah. But I, three months later, five years ago, so in the summer of 2016, Michael Phelps advertised cupping for the world with, yeah. uh, with uh, constantly showing all the, the red uh, suction cup marks. And now it is so commonly requested. It, it's really remarkable how much. And so uh, and there's all different forms of it now. Some less effective than others but traditionally and especially if we're going to do it on the forum we would be using fire cupping use a glass cup and we're able to create really strong suction now um do you have any cups there that you could demonstrate i not in the room but if you give me a second i could go grab them. okay yeah we'd love that we'd love okay that. i'll be right back okay so uh, some of the questions uh let's see here Um, I'm always looking for things people can do at home and um, different perspectives on treating uh, ulnar sided wrist pain. And acupuncture is one of, um, I send people often to acupuncture. I get really good feedback from people that it helps. It helps a lot with ECU tendonitis and FCU tendonitis. Um, it, it, it is remarkable. And the treatment protocol usually is two times a week for four weeks. Um, if you can do more, if you can do some at home, that's great, if you have access to it. But um, two times a week is what I usually try to get people to um, try, and the results have been really um, measurable. So I, I, uh, I, I really like acupuncture as a modality to treat muscle and tendon um, um, pain and dysfunction. Um, and okay, so acupuncture is uh, it's a self referral. Um, if you're under workers' comp, then you need to have a doctor um, send you uh, to get it authorized and approved. But if you're in a workers' comp system, I'd ask for a prescription for two times a week for four to six weeks. And if you're not in that system, um, if you have insurance that covers acupuncture, you may need to get a referral. But in general, you can just walk in anywhere and ask for it. Okay, yay. Okay, so first I will demonstrate the more accessible form of cupping, which uh, is often, uh, well, it's, it's done more commonly, we'll just say. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to use it on the arm, this is the... Create the suction, you just squish it, and squish is a technical term, and then... And then it just hangs on. So it's created yeah. suction and it's hanging on. But yeah. because that large surf, uh, small surface area for a large um, opening on that means it's not very good. So like the glass cup here would also not stay on very well on an arm. So we go with a much smaller version. And so then this one yeah. would be the one that I would use. And again, when I was talking about the... Um, the, the yang surface or the outside of the arm is more where we do this. And that again is tougher because you, you tend to have a little less flesh there over the bone. So you start to have a little more, uh, a little more ridge we'll say, and it needs a smoother, flatter surface to really stick. So in this case, we'd probably be targeting, well, I mean, ultimately on the ulnar side, you know, so you, you do have a little bit more meat along here if we were to try to effectively do some cupping for this. The other thing is I, I actually would, as opposed to a stationary cup, yeah. which I would demonstrate this, um, the fire cup, because that's always fun. Um, the, as opposed to a stationary cup, I would actually, because of the length of these muscles, 
I would actually like to do a moving cupping technique. Yeah. And in that, what we're doing is um, we would apply some sort of, uh, usually an oil-based uh, solution. I, I have uh, a Chinese topical that I like that's medicated and it penetrates into the tissues as well. But then it has a nice glide. And so you'd create the suction and then you would just slide it along the muscle. And so again, no. you're just... Go ahead. Are there any are there any rules on um, uh, gliding it with the muscle on stretch versus on slack? More so, you're just gonna want to have it relaxed. Okay. You're gonna wanna have them in a, in a in a relaxed position, um, yeah. especially if you're gonna do stationary cups because yeah, you're gonna have to stay there for a little bit. How long? So yes, I mean, there in, in terms of whether you're actively flexing, yeah, if you're gonna, you could get. Uh, more specialized and, and in that case you would be taking it off and on repetitively mm -hmm. so what was really neat is one of the um, physicians I, I was uh, following when I was doing an internship in Beijing was a specialist in cupping and I thought that I through my primary education had learned enough about cupping and then watching a true master of, of, yeah. of someone uh, you know it's I, I do a, in my practice I, I'm a general practitioner I do treat a wide range of conditions and I use for the most part a wide range of tools. So I wouldn't necessarily call myself a cupping uh, expert or master, but this person I definitely could. And watching the, the, the rhythm, it's, it's a dance in that case when, when you're using a lot of different cups and it's on and off and then this one slides and that one stays and you come back and you just keep, it's like a, a conductor working an orchestra. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you light the cup, you, it, it, the cotton ball has alcohol in it. And so mm -hmm. then you're gonna, and this is gonna be hard to do on my arm uh, since I need both arms. Um, yeah. But anyways, you put the, put the fire in there and it basically evacuates all the oxygen and then you would quickly follow it to whatever the surface is. Yeah. Again, if, without a third arm, I'm gonna have a hard time doing that on yeah. my arm. <laughs> but that's, that's the gist is that basically you're just getting rid of the oxygen within the cup yeah, yeah, yeah. Too, too far it. of a carry. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now it creates this heat. Yes. And then well, it it's, it's actually, ideally, you're not getting heat. Okay. So ideally, it's, it's, it's in there very briefly. So right now, because I was holding it in there for demonstration, the cup's starting to warm. Yeah. But, but generally, it's in and out, and all it's doing is just eating up the oxygen, right? That's what yeah. fire burns is oxygen. So it's eating up the oxygen. You quickly remove it and then very quickly attach it so oxygen hasn't had a chance to come back in. It's essentially yeah. a vacuum. And so theoretically then, and ideally it's not hot because then the, the heat would be burning the skin. Yeah, yeah. So, um, right. but yes, so, it, it will, especially with repetitive use, they will start to warm up, which is why, again, if you're, if you're doing a full cupping practice, you're gonna have a large array of cups so that you can be rotating so they don't get hot. Right. Okay, so then you've got the suction, and the amount of suction is is variable. So some people you see, they create a suction that's strong enough that it elevates the skin. Right. It creates kind of a bubble. Correct. And, um, and I would imagine those bubbles are there for static placement, and then a very small bubble for, for movement. You are correct. Yeah. And also duration. If okay. you're going to have that raised bubble, you're not going to want to leave that very long because you're, okay. you're going to be damaging tissue at that point. Yeah. The skin and, and the, the fascia and, and so on. So you want a, a gentle bubble and, and then you move that along the flexors or the extensors mm -hmm. and, um, and you do that for how long? Again, that's going to be variable. And this is where, yeah. you know, the, when you talk about all these techniques and talk about the needling techniques and everything else that there's, yeah. there's, general idea and it is going to then highly modify based on the individual's constitution how what is yeah. their vitality right was this yeah. was this a professional gymnast or weightlifter in which case they can handle i right. can i can i can be a little more assertive and aggressive so i can have a stronger bubble i can leave it a little longer so yeah. in longer maybe you know five to ten minutes with a strong bubble versus if i were doing that on somebody who's uh let's say it happened because of a car accident yeah and this is, you know, somebody who's older or more frail, yeah. then I'm probably going to be doing a very gentle bubble for very brief bursts. In other words, we, but we also then you're, you're having to then shift the, your whole treatment plan, right? To where yeah. it's a more longer term recovery. You can't push through as, as aggressively. 
Okay, so can you talk to me on a different note about <clears throat> the the, uh, the uh, stagnation, mm -hmm. heat, yes, and cold? Yes. So the cool thing within our our medicine is those are our those are our pathogens, right? We don't yeah. talk about bacteria and virus and fungus because. You know, a few thousand years ago, there weren't microscopes to even understand that those things existed. But what you could see is the result of those things, right? And they're going to yeah. generate certain reactions in the body. And so that's going to be the heat. Stagnation is a more general term, which can heat and cold are both a stagnate as a pathogen become stagnant. So they are a stagnation. But then there can just be a generalized stagnation that's not uh, neither hot or cold. Mm -hmm. A lot of times purple is the indicative color of that. So especially if you're going to do cupping, the reaction you can see if it's more red than it is purple, then there is a heat element there. And that's going to be more of an acute um, in the moment inflammation. Whereas if it's a longer term uh, injury and recovery, you're likely to see more purple tones mm -hmm. because it, it's not so much about an acute inflammation, which is going to be that heat. It's more about that long-term stagnation to where, because of whatever damage has occurred, circulation is just not happening. Yeah. I've had some really remarkable experiences with people with um, distal radius fractures with hand swelling. And I'll measure their, their swelling with a, a volumetric measurement tool that we use. Displace, they, we displace water, measure the water, and then I'll send them down to have acupuncture yeah. after trying elevation compression you know myofascial lymphatic massage all of this stuff that we do and uh, just it doesn't go anywhere and they go down and they get acupuncture with just needles yeah and they come back and their swelling is gone it's measurably gone it, and i'm it's really so curious. rewarding the few things that you get to treat where you can watch yeah the and yeah. Yeah, acute swelling and the redness that will that will show up, you know, when somebody has an acute injury, it's it's it's, it's not only swollen, but red, you can watch that tone change, you know, yeah. in the course of you, you insert the needles and over the course of the treatment, by the time the treatment is done, it is visibly different. Yeah. And yeah. it's nice. Um, feedback. So, so how do you approach tendon pathology? Tendons are trickier. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, obviously, the, I, the, the balance between finding how much to rest them and how much to keep them in motion, mm -hmm. you know, like you, you want to move it, but just enough. Yeah. And, and, and that's, a, that's, that's the art of medicine. You know, it's, yeah. it's the one thing I really love about medicine I practice is, you know, there's, there's data, there's 4,000 years of data to, yeah. to what we've done, but the actual practice of it has to be an art because in that individual's case, you, you getting them to understand uh, how much to immobilize and then yet you can't let those tendons dry out and become so tight because then you got a bigger hill to climb at the end of the healing. You yeah. know, you have to balance that when it's very acute. I do really like strict immobilization. Yeah. Um, very initially and do everything you can to try to pull the trauma out of that area. But I, more often I like, I like the use of heat when it's muscles and tendons. I like the use of heat mm -hmm. when it's actually at the, when, when it's crossing, when the tendons are crossing over the joint at yeah. that location, I'm a little more hesitant with the heat and do tend to like a little more ice, at least in the early stage. Mm -hmm. And, um, but trying to, to balance how to keep enough circulation going through something that's not naturally well uh, well circulated uh, yeah. tendon ligaments yeah. um, you know that's the challenge and that is the good thing once you get more towards the chronic stage that's where acupuncture is uh, another area that it, it does shine is again with that idea of the micro trauma is we yeah. can go where the body may have already forgotten about this and moved on yep. to other problems yeah we can go and remind it by nicking that little tendon in those areas and then boom the body's going to flood circulation there again okay so tell me the difference between what you do and dry needling so this is this is an interesting conversation. Um, in this state, um, the only people that can do dry needling are, are acupuncturists. 
Yeah. And there aren't many states where that's the case anymore. So dry needling is a subset of acupuncture. It is, yeah. it is ter terminology derived from um, uh, trigger point. Yeah. Uh, therapy originally researched 40, 40 years ago. Yeah. And originally they were using hypodermic needles and they were, they, were, they, they were injecting and then they realized they don't have to inject. And then they realized, well, if we're not gonna inject, we don't need to use a hypodermic needle because it's a blunt instrument. Yeah. It's a big needle. And so, yeah. They moved it over to use, if they're not injecting, they just, they, they differentiated by calling it wet and dry. So this yeah. became just kind of dry needling. And, yeah. and that nomenclature kind of fizzled out. It wasn't really much of anything until, you know, probably around 20 years ago. And, and then it became a way to name a type of acupuncture. So what we, within acupuncture, we have the meridians, as you mentioned, yeah. like the small intestine and the heart meridian. And we have along those meridians, we have a bunch of, points. These are access points, essentially. Now, there are 365 main meridian access points, but there's a few thousand other points that are just not either on those meridians directly, or they're along that meridian, and they're just not considered one of those main named points. Now, some of that's just the evolution of the medicine over time, and how it's designed to be taught in classrooms now versus you know, a, a lifetime of study under your, your, your father or your you know, uh, town master. And, uh, and so anyways, the, what that, the, the term we use instead of dry needling is uh, sure. And that just means point of access. It's just mm -hmm. anywhere that you're going to find a tender spot, a point of access. Well, it's probably telling us something. And so we may want to put a needle there. We may not, but, uh, so that's, that's, we, we would call it uh, sure needling. It's now called dry needling because that's been used as a term for, other professions to be able to apply acupuncture, essentially a workaround within scope of practice legislation. Gotcha. And, and so it's, it, it's unfortunate because it's created a confusion, right? And in, yeah. in, 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 in the landscape of well-educated people are, are, are actually kind of confused about what's what. And, um, but it, it is a little more clear uh, January last year, uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, uh, in, a, in a ruling about the use of acupuncture for chronic low back pain, ended up defining dry needling as acupuncture, which is, it is. It's just... Yeah. Um, uh, it's the same needles. It's the same needles. It's the same locations. Yeah. And so when yeah. you ask, like, what is it that I do this different? So the, I actually would be classifying that approach because dry needling is the idea that you're hitting uh, motor or trigger points, yes. uh, usually on the surface of, of, of muscles. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea there is by doing that, you're freeing up the mobility, right? Joint mobility. And, and it's something that we do. I just put that under my, more of my sports medicine training, my, yeah. and, 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 and really the, the bread and butter of any, acupuncturists until they decide they're going to specialize. I have an acupuncture that works with me here. That's a pediatric specialist, but by and large, the bread and butter of any acupuncture practice is the treatment of pain conditions, whether they're acute or chronic. Yeah. And so the use of that approach is pretty common. Uh, most people, they even there's, when I say that it's a confusing thing, there's a lot of acupuncturists and I have a group that I, I, um, when I first moved to Maui, there's a, about six of us that had all moved here within about a year of each other. And we became friends and we have a dinner once a year. And we just did a Zoom meeting dinner a few months ago. And we were talking about that. And I'm, half of them did not know what dry needling was. Yeah. And they're, here, here's pretty well-educated acupuncturists who are <clears throat> excuse me, actually doing what is considered dry needling in their yeah. practice. They just didn't know that that's what that is. And so, yeah, yeah it, it's unfortunate just because for the – for the uh, consumer, for the, the patients, it's confusing. Yeah. It's right. really. I, I kind of, I get the idea that um, it, people found that acupuncture was so beneficial, but mm -hmm. there weren't, they didn't have access to acupuncture in their uh, relative area. And so they all... started to do dry needling as an adjunct to the therapy out of need. Right. And now there's a dry needling institute, and now you have rehab oh, yeah. therapists doing dry needling without the background, really. I mean, there's a training, of course, that you go through to do it, but right. it's a very superficial. It's um, cursory, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. The, the, my frustration with it, when, the, when we first started talking, and I was talking about how I might needle the muscle belly, if we're yeah. treating 
the rest. I'd, I'd needle in here, but I'd also come up here somewhere. Yeah. And dry needling as a practice can do that and can't actually. Most of the time in the way that their scope is written, they can, they're only limited to treating here. Uh -huh. And they can't go to these distal points. Huh. And yet that's what really makes it effective a lot of time. Yeah. And, yeah. so, and so what will happen is, and again, this is where my, my frustration is, is that so people may go get dry needling from somebody who's only been, you know, a, a specific mm -hmm. type of medical practitioner, it's not an acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. They'll try this a couple of times. It'll hurt because they're not necessarily don't have the tactile training and practice and experience. So it'll be a, a, almost a torture kind of treatment. And then it will be effective yeah. because all you've done is hit here and you haven't treated the whole of, of the being and uh, of the body. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, it, and then that person now says, Oh, well, I've, I've tried acupuncture or dry needling and it didn't right. work. It's like, well, not really. <laughs> yeah. So. That's why I needed to ask that question. Yeah. Okay. I, I, so um, I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm on our, uh, state, uh, I'm on the board of our state association for, um, for acupuncture and it's that's been an issue we've had to deal with a lot in these last couple of years yeah so it yeah i you be careful when you ask a question i might talk for a very long time yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so ulnar-sided wrist pain um the majority of people that develop ulnar-sided wrist pain this is changing but for the for the most part people have it for six months or more yeah and um, so there's, uh, there's a dysfunction that develops with an unstable wrist that's predictable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so they develop a tight ECU, a overworked FCU, um, an ulnar nerve or radial nerve, uh, irritation at the elbow. So let's just talk just, just, uh, quickly because the, of the, of the things that I see that are the, the most responsive to acupuncture and are the least responsive to other things is FCU tendonitis. And so with the FCU tendonitis, I had asked acupuncturists all around the globe, um, China, Taiwan, Japan, Netherlands, US, New York, Canada, um, and I got a consensus that this is related to the heart meridian. And so I started having people, um, you know, uh, support their heart with minerals and, and mm -hmm. make sure they're not dehydrated and make sure they've got enough potassium and magnesium and sodium on board and all of that. But by far the people that find the best um, uh, results are the people with, uh, from acupuncture are FCU, F, flexor carpi ulnaris insertional pain. So right. in this particular case, what would you, well, just, just without knowing the details, knowing that they have it, have had it for a long time, yeah. knowing that their flexor carpi ulnaris is taking the load and they've got a tendonitis at the insertion, a really tight muscle belly, um, some pull at the elbow that affects the ulnar nerve. What would, what would, you, what would you typically do? So I, I agree that in that case, it becomes, it, it does tend to relate more to the heart meridian at that point. And, and so when I was talking about the yin and yang earlier, and I was mm -hmm. saying initially we would focus more on the yang and the acute mm -hmm. phase but once you're dealing with something that lingers right and this yeah. is any condition once it lingers it becomes something else yeah and, and so oftentimes once a condition becomes more chronic it actually starts to present as a more yin condition so in that case that's why we would see more it kind of shift more from from over here uh -huh. to more in here uh -huh. And so, and it's also at that point gonna start driving, it's, this is the, the fingers and the wrists and the toes and the ankles are the most distal and superficial parts of our body. Our organs are the most proximal, right? They're the most protected and the most guarded. So severe disease is in here and superficial diseases are out here on yeah. the, sorry, out there, my hands were outside the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so what happens is the longer a disease uh, is present, the more likely it's become more yin and also start moving more yeah. towards the core. Yeah. So the approach at that point has to be multifaceted and it's not, it's, it, and so you're right, when you're starting to look at what can you take in now, what minerals, what things can you do to support the body different from just putting on a topical abrace and right. you know, some exercises. So and those don't I, work. Those make things worse. A lot of times, um, yes. Yeah. Yes. 
And so at that point, you are still, and I, I do a lot of a dance back and forth with, with patients that I'm dealing with in this, with this type of presentation, is I will sometimes, I will treat the original injury, and I will treat those muscle bellies, and I will treat the tendons, and I will try to focus on that. But then the next time, I'm going to go to treating more of the whole person, which is going to be the fact that what happens after you, especially with, for humans, right? This mm -hmm. and this are what, why, why there's so many of us on the planet and why we can do so many different things. Yeah. So you take that away from somebody and what's it going to affect? It's going to affect their livelihood. It's going to affect mm -hmm. their, their sense of self and all those mm -hmm. other aspects that start getting into psychology as well as again, different organs and, and systems. So, I also, I alternate back and forth between the styles of treatment that I'll do to try to help support that so that I can be addressing the heart and I will come up here, you know, to like a golfer's point and I will start, you know, and this is a heart, this is a heart point here and I will start to come, uh, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll definitely get up here, you know, there's, there's hardly anything that I treat in the wrist or hand that I won't also simultaneously address the neck and upper back area because you want it you, like you said what happens is especially once you create the immobilization right yeah it's going to be the wrist that they stop using right they're going to start holding the arm up like this yeah. and all of a sudden, so that's why all those other conditions so there's a there's the you can go through a musculoskeletal explanation of why it occurs that way um i can go through a very deeply uh theoretical chinese medicine with a lot of flowery terminology but it's also just think about it, you know, just think about the common sense of the mechanisms, and what that means. If you can't use your wrist and it's your dominant hand, then what is that doing to your life? You know, it's affecting you in so many different ways. So we have to address all of that. And that's, again, why I love my medicine is because it's, it looks at all that and it doesn't separate it. It doesn't, uh, it, we, we really do look at that whole being. So what I see as, as it progresses, particularly the flexor carpi ulnaris, because it's the main flexor of the wrist, it's the most functional piece of equipment we have in the wrist. It's the strongest flexor. It's hard to turn off. It develops into a cascade of dysfunction because it's pretty painful to use your arm. So it does affect. But I also see that it, um, they, they have a lot of heat. You know, when they go to acupuncture and they come back and I ask, well, what did the acupuncturist say? They all say, well, I have heat, yeah. and, um, and, and they can almost see it in g go down through the lats and at the insertion of the lats, and it can cause a kind of upper cervical heat, but they consistently c talk about this heat. Right. And so aside from going and having an acupuncture treatment and doing that uh, regularly and becoming more aware of, of all of that, do you have, in this particular case, a herbal recommendation? Turmeric. Turmeric. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, the thing is, is there's a lot of, turmeric's a Chinese herb, ginger's a tiny, Chinese herb, cinnamon's a Chinese herb, yet these are also things that are in our cupboard. Yeah. And, and they're food. And so I, I, you know, my herbal approach is I, I'm more conservative. I have, a, I have a full herbal pharmacy and I do prescribe herbs regularly. However, that's not my initial approach. My initial approach yeah. is, first of all, let's see what you can do at home. Let's see yeah. what you can do. We just make a couple little adjustments to your regular lifestyle. And, yeah. and that may, that's likely to have a longer effect. And if you think about, uh, you know, I, so I always, uh, oxygen, water, and food are three things we can't live without. You can go uh, minutes, days, or weeks without, uh, respectively. But so why not maximize our use of those things? Yeah. Breathe better, drink clean water, and eat better foods. And so eat better foods is always a relative thing to the individual. And so mm -hmm. if somebody's dealing with uh, chronic pain and that heat, so what the turmeric is going to do is actually it's a it's an, a blood invigorator. So the reason why that heat has developed is because of long-term stagnation. Yeah. So the example for that is if you drive your car into uh, clay or mud and you get it stuck and you don't do anything to try to solve the stuck except just hit the accelerator, yeah. your car is going to overheat and you're going to break the engine eventually. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to get anywhere. And that's that stagnation that's occurring for these long-term injuries is 
the 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 circulation keeps trying but there's nowhere to go so it eventually starts building up heat so that that and that, and it's the blood circulation in this case and so the the uh the turmeric will help so the turmeric that comes you know dried in a bottle in the spice rack don't use that yeah get fresh turmeric you know yeah. you and i are lucky enough to live in a place yeah. where it's, it's right outside yeah. um but yeah, get get it from and and you know cook with it, uh, shred it and and into your foods, juice it, uh, or or just slice it and make tea out of it, which is the more traditional Chinese route. Right. And then, what about a topical treatment? So topicals, I that's where um, my go-to has had for a long time has been something called Zengu Shui, uh, which is a Chinese topical formula that is one of those, um, you know, secret formulas, if you will. Um, and it unfortunately is about to find its way off my shelves because over the last 20 years, there's been about three or four different times where they've seemed to have tinkered with the formula and is not as effective anymore. Now that said, it's also not as risky because before I had to give people very strict instructions, you know, use it, apply it, throw the cotton ball away, wash your hands really, really well so you don't touch anywhere inadvertently. Well, now I think you could probably I'm not going to say this. I was going to say you could probably drink it and it'd be fine, but no, yeah, don't right. do that. <laughs> don't do that. You, you, it's, it's, it's very mild now, so it's not as effective. Um, but yeah, I, I, I tend to like that because the, the translation of that is, is rectify the bone water. So Zhang Gu Shui. Um, and, and the idea is that it was designed for traumatic bone injury. Well, mm -hmm. and, and that just means that it penetrates the deepest level is going to be our bone. Mm -hmm. so it's going to go through all those other tissues on the way there. So if I were dealing with a, a, an actual muscle belly tear, yeah. uh, brain, I probably would, I would use something different. But when you start getting into the tendons, the ligaments, the cartilage, the joints, mm -hmm. this is a phenom or was a phenomenal uh, topical. Um, I, I, I do know there is a, an acupuncturist on, on the mainland who is now has recreated what nice. he believes is the original formula and i'm just I, i've got to find some time to to track it down and start yeah. caring but as far as things that people may have for themselves turmeric yeah great great some turmeric just grate it and then just uh make a poultice of it and just kind of put it on yeah and don't, then don't wrap it it. i'm sorry wrap yeah it and wrap it. it and then you know take it off after you know 15 20 minutes or so um yeah. And don't be surprised that your skin turns yellow orange. Yeah. yeah. It, it won't stay that way forever, I promise. Yeah. Okay, so um, as far as uh, frequency and duration, um, what's your general thoughts on frequency and duration of acupuncture? Like if you were to somebody that was just starting out and wanted to give acupuncture a try, is your general protocol two weeks, two times a week for six weeks? Kind of, yeah. I, I my what I usually do is I have I, people try to come in three times within the first ten days, and this oh, yeah. is whether it's an acute and if it's an acute mm -hmm. injury, and I think that we can take it from, you know, a three month uh, problem down to a few weeks or so, like a yeah. let's say a severe sprain, then I might even accelerate that just a little bit. Let's really whack this thing and get it done. But right. most often, I have people come in three times in ten days. And that gives me the full opportunity to assess all the layers of what the problem yeah. is and what yeah. we need to put together as a comprehensive treatment plan. And then after that, yeah, a lot of times it's going to be somewhere in the range of a couple times a week uh, for a few more weeks. Mm -hmm. And then especially once you gain momentum and, and you know, you, you know that you've got the right pieces in place, you figured out the right balance of, of how to immobilize, how often, how to use, how often, in what ways what to to eat differently, what what if anything you're taking early or, or other, what types of other therapies you're doing. Mm -hmm. All of that factors into it. And, I, you know, again, I'm more of a, a common sense and make sure it fits into your life kind yeah. of a prescriber because I can tell you to do something. Yeah, the best example is somebody who's trying to lose weight and they eat McDonald's three times, Happy Meals three times a day with a milkshake. Well, you tell them to start eating salads all the time. It's a failed treatment plan. Yeah. Yeah. But if you get them to cut out one milkshake a day for the first week, you might have some success. And yeah. so um, 
Yeah. So that, that's kind of the thing is I try to make sure within that first couple of weeks that I really get the person figured out well enough to know that what we're doing is going to work and then also get them to understand this is going to be three months. This is going to be two years, whatever it may be for whatever the condition is. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, a lot of people, I was really surprised when I, I spent five years in Europe and I was really surprised at um, the, the, the lack of acupuncturists in Europe. Yeah. Um, I saw more of them up in the Netherlands. Um, they were really hard to come by in France, in Germany. Um, and, and, and it's kind of sad, actually. I, I'm yeah. very sad about that. Um, you know, on the other side of the coin, there was a lot, of course, in Asia, but it just really hasn't made its way for a lot of reasons into Europe. And so I'm wondering, is, has the acupuncturist community um, dabbled with any online treatments where somebody purchases their own acupuncture needles, they're able to assess them with their tongue and their eyes and by their symptoms and walk them? Not, are you, okay, there you go. Um, not yeah. really uh, that I'm aware of. And, and the interesting thing is over this last year, especially with the pandemic and, uh, and a lot of, uh, yeah. a lot of the allopathic healthcare has just switched to where it's, this is how the, this is how your appointments go. Uh, through, a, yeah. through a screen, um, yeah. you know, most of our medicine is, is, is more hands-on as we as, yeah. So that would be one of the ways that that could be done. Um, the safety issue is, you know, that's, of course, Huge. the risk, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, when you're looking at people, and, and as you said earlier with the dry needling, the one exception that I really do look at for, for dry needling is, is remote areas where yeah. the... And, and so as you say, with Europe, where the access to a trained uh, and licensed acupuncturist is, is hard, difficult. Yeah. What are those solutions? And, and what I've always tended to do is I work, I would, when I work with people remotely, I work with them herbally. I, I, I can work with them herbally and I can then coach them on, uh, you know, things they can do at home between stretching. Yeah. But it, but I hadn't thought about the idea of, uh, teaching them how to needle themselves and, and, yeah. and do that. But pressure points, uh, the use of, you know, you, it's, it's what some people, when they come in and they're nervous about receiving acupuncture because of the mm -hmm. needle itself. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and I'll explain to them that, you know, I can do it without a needle. I can press on the spot, but I promise you that's going to be a lot more sore than what I can do with a needle yeah. because needle, I can get to the spot very precisely. And my <laughs> technique is, is relatively gentle and not, overly assertive. I'm not going to be, you know, some people, you know, it's like uh, Jason, right? They're like jamming, twisting and doing all that and to each their own, but that's not my technique. Mine is more to kind of get it to the spot and let the body assimilate that information for itself. And that's again, probably why I don't use the e-stem as often, but, um, but, uh, you know, so for somebody to do that for themselves, they could press, you know, but to really be effective with that, there's also going to be technique that, you know, yeah. and you, you can coach them on that, but really your, your, your thumb or your fingers are, a, are cover a bigger area than that tiny little needle. So you're affecting a lot more tissue than necessary. Yeah. Uh, I did order um, acupuncture needles before I went to Europe. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, that's a long story, but I, I, I wasn't able to receive them in Hawaii. And right. um, so I had to order them and send them to another state and then have them forward to me. And then I thought, well, I'll just take these um, with me to Europe. And it made me, you know, they, they come with a, uh, a, a, you know, they have a little tube on them so that when you pop them into your skin, it, they're, you're, you're, it's controlled. Yeah. It um, is. And, and, and you, I you, thought. I, I have a lot of my, my pediatric patients that are you know they're a little nervous about it yeah. so I'll, I'll use that tube and i'll put it there and have the needle inside it and i'll tell them i'm like it's in the right spot and yeah. all you have to do is that yeah whenever right. you're ready do it and they'll do it to themselves yeah and uh right and i thought well you know i know that uh uh the the benefit of acupuncture is very clear in my world um it's it's very clear 
and um, yet it's not available to majority of the people on this planet. Right. And right. I, um, I, um, you know, it'd be really interesting to to define a um, some treatment plans for people. Um, that have ulnar side to risk pain. And I say that with he hesitation um, because I know what that means legally. Um, <laughs> but, it, you know, I, I, I use them for a variety of different things and I found yeah. that they were very helpful, even from a naive perspective. And I certainly yeah. didn't do any harm to myself. Right. And, um, yeah. Well, that's so the part of that is you can, you know, there is the ethical thing of the physician giving the person the tool to do themselves. But at the same time, if you're going to do that to yourself, that's, you know, it's your prerogative. Right. Right. Yeah. Especially if it has great value. Um, now, do you, um, do you, is, is your practice uh, very specific to people um, on Maui or do you ever do any sort of consults or uh, treatments um, for people outside the state? I definitely well, do. Outside the island, not yeah. out of the state, outside the island. Outside the island, yes. <laughs> and, and as far as educational consult, um, yeah. that can be done, yeah, and, and that is done anywhere. But, um, but as far as actually prescribing any sort of uh, treatment that is, yeah, uh, in Hawaii. But, yeah, um, yeah so I, I do, and I support more often it's what it, when it comes to people that are not on Maui, uh, it, it's usually – some of my current patients, it's their family, friends, or, or whomever. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if they're if they're elsewhere, I, I I also do try to help facilitate them getting to the right person, yeah. so that they can see locally. Because you know, and back to that idea about doing things remotely. Again, when you lack of access is is, is the exception for that, of course. But uh, but but otherwise, I you know, one of the reasons why I did go into this is I, I, I like the human connection of yeah. the medicine I practice and, yeah. and, and that's why I do it. So, yeah. And it has great value. If you can have right. your hands on the person, um, you learn a lot more than if you so. were to do it on online. All right. Well, um, anybody have any questions? We have a lot of people who joined today and um, go ahead and send any questions. Have you treated, I'm just curious, have you treated any hamate fractures? Any which? Hamate fractures, you know, here. I, you know, the, in terms of, it, it, this was the interesting thing when you, we were first talking about doing this, is by and large, the, the most things that I treat when we're talking from, from well, let's say from the elbow down, um, carpal tunnel and trigger fingers. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of, all the other pathologies, I really don't see a lot of them. And I, yeah. and it, it's, I started making me wonder because I, you know, I was like, well, why I see a lot, I treat a lot of feet issues. I treat a lot of, um, you know, <laughs> and, and, and everywhere else on the body, but, but it's in, in the carpal tunnel more often than not is, is, is again, something up here anyways. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and the, the, the trigger finger is often thyroid. Yeah, thyroid, and then also it's majority of the time I'm also still working the same. You know, the answer right. is kind of similar. For our medicine, the answer is kind of similar regardless of how specific we want to get with the, you know, the only difference is when we're talking about fract, we're talking about bone, then yeah. there's an element of how I go about treating that systemically. If we're talking about tendon or, or cartilage or, you know, then that's, that's where the variation comes is the type of tissue. Yeah. Um, so the general location, not, not, overly specific, the general location, the type of tissue, and then the mechanisms, you know, the yeah. actual mechanism of injury, um, you know, is it, uh, is, is it traumatic in nature or is it repetitive stress? Yeah, um, or an imbalance or all of that. Right, yeah. exactly. So I, the, I know you, you have your uh, medicine has a very specific idea about function of an organ and dysfunction in the tendon versus in a ligament. So in general, am I right that tendons are related to the pancreas? So uh, more so liver. Liver. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. And then the, the, the uh, uh, cartilage is related to? We look at that. So this is where, again, some of this modern differentiation of tissue yeah. doesn't apply to how the medicine. So we have to kind of loosely translate in some cases. Yes. So, 
when we're looking at like fascia, yeah. we're looking at more of a spleen. When we're looking at muscle and tendon, we're look well, tendon, I should say, we're looking at liver, but when we're looking at the actual muscle, it's kind of like the bridge between the spleen and the liver. Uh -huh. So then you start going into bone is kidney, but then yeah. you go to cartilage and ligament and you're yeah. getting into like a kidney bridging into um into the liver into spleen yeah. and right. so the uh the pancreas though is actually a term that doesn't exist in chinese medicine we don't have a meridian for that <laughs> except that we know. when we look at what the spleen is and and the way that we've defined the spleen uh organ and meridian in chinese medicine it actually is probably the pancreas yeah and so and then, yeah. what about the gallbladder so the gallbladder is the liver's buddy. That's yeah. their, their, their a yin and yang pair. Yeah. And the gallbladder is actually kind of referred to as a little bit special. So you have your yin organs, which are the, the, they're solid, they're dense, right? So a heart, a lung, a liver, a spleen, a kidney. And then you have your hollow organs. So the intestines, small and large, the gallbladder, the urinary bladder, the stomach, they basically, they're holding places, right? They hold yeah. things. And so uh, the gallbladder is thought to be a little bit special because it holds the bile. It holds yeah. a, a very special fluid. So it's kind of, uh, it's the most special of all of those hollow organs, the, the yang. Yeah. And it uh, has a lot to do with uh, decision making. And when we are looking at tendons in particular, uh -huh. it, it has a, it, 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 more so than probably the liver, we might be looking at the gallbladder. We, we, we nourish it with the liver, but we really uh, support the flexibility with the gallbladder. Yeah, because I see a gallbladder with the lateral or ECU, lateral epicondylitis at the elbow. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I, I say, well, this is maybe connected to your gallbladder. And oddly, those people say that they, you know, digestion, um, they, they just have a hard time with large meals and meat and things of that sort. Right. Well, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day. I enjoyed it's it. It's a beautiful day outside. And so I hear. I'm going to get out there soon. Just super grateful for your thoughts and your time and your expertise. And um, thank you for doing such wonderful things for the community of Maui. And um, aloha. Aloha. Have a, have a nice day. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Likewise. Bye.